worship.
Let's take a moment, church, and breathe in his presence today. The presence of the living God is in this room. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. He's with us. With his presence comes peace. That means there's peace in this room. In his presence there is joy. There is hope. There is freedom. Don't underestimate the power of his presence. Thank you, Jesus. We give you our attention today, Father. You deserve our attention. We think about you, Jesus. We think about what you've done for us. We're thankful that you saved us. We thank you that you love us. the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my come on let's tell Jesus that you, you are good You're 
never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. See now, now. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. this morning no matter what he's good <laughs> oh come what may we're still gonna sing that he's good oh you're good you're good and we cling to you Jesus we hold on to you Jesus you're never letting go you're never letting go
Thank you, Jesus. One of the phrases we just sang was, he's the light in the darkness. And I just sense there's some people right now who you would describe your life as like, man, things seem really dark. I can't find my way out. I keep bumping into walls. And God's here today to tell you that he is your light in the darkness. No matter what, look up, look up. You know, the light is always bright when, when it's dark, you can see the light better. Just a few weeks ago, I was up in the mountains in Tioga County doing some four-wheeling with some of my kids and friends. And um, we were out at night and it was so dark. And we're not used to being that dark around here, but I saw more stars that night than I've seen for a long time. And I just wanna encourage you, no matter how dark it seems right now, when you look up, Jesus, the light of the world, has got his light shining for you. And he'll show you the way. He'll show you the way out. He'll show you the way out. So that may be for someone particular right here in this room or watching online. God's looking out for you. I'd like us to join together in praying. And I'd like us to focus uh, right now on praying for our president and his wife, Melania, President Trump. Uh, as you know, they both were diagnosed with coronavirus. And so let's join together and pray as we are with many other people across this nation, Father. We come this morning, we do lift up President Trump, his wife Melania, to you in Jesus' name. We speak healing power of Jesus Christ into their lives right now. Father, I pray, God, that you would raise them up again, Father. I pray that you would uh, give wisdom to the doctors that are attending to them. Father, we pray also for others that are, have been affected, Lord, many, many thousands across this land 
maybe people that we know or in our families or we ourselves, Father, we continue to stand for healing. We continue to stand, God, for this uh, virus that's affecting our land and our world to be brought down in the name of Jesus, Lord. We pray, Father, you said in your word, Lord, that by your stripes we were healed. God, we know that every disease and every sickness comes under the name of Jesus. So we de continue to declare coronavirus, you must bow to the name of Jesus. We declare it in Jesus' name. And if you're in agreement this morning, just go ahead and say amen. Amen, amen. 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 Well, it was so good to worship with you. You can go ahead and be seated. Welcome to all of you, those of you that are here in the house this morning, those of you that are watching online, anywhere you are in the world, whether it's nearby or across uh, the seas, wherever it is, we just are so grateful that you're here. You know, one thing that I know, when we lift up the name of Jesus, when we pray together, when we hear God's word together, when we encourage each other, the presence of God is there, no matter where that is, whether you're with two people or whether you're with hundreds of people. And you know what I've found in my life, when God's presence is there and I'm aware of it, things change. Things change in me, things change in the people around us. So it's so good to gather and lift up his name this morning. So this morning, our young adult pastor, Shannon Kahn, is going to be bringing, bringing us the message here in a few minutes. All right. Shannon, there you go. You've got a few fans here this morning. That's awesome. He's got a great word continuing in our series about what are we known for. Uh, before he comes, I have a few things to draw your attention to. We have an election coming up in 29 days. How about that? And uh, we just want to encourage you uh, to get involved in voting. You know, we have this amazing privilege in our country to help select those that will be leading our government at every level, local, state, and national. And as followers of Christ, we are citizens of heaven, the Bible tells us, but also gives us instruction to be good citizens of the country where we live. And so we want to encourage you to, to uh, vote, be prepared for that. This morning, we have voter registration forms available for those of you that need, uh, need those. So the ushers have them. Here's a reason you might need one if you've never voted. Uh, so you can raise your hand if you, if you need one. If you've never voted, if you've turned 18 in this past year, or you will turn 18 before November the 3rd, uh, maybe you moved, changed your address, or changed your name, or want to change your party affiliation, you would need one. So uh, we have them here. Also, you can register online, and you can go to, I believe it's uh, votespa.com, and uh, you could register that way as well. All right. Well, we're going to give our tithes and offerings, and uh, I just wanted to think a bit about money this morning. Do you know money takes a lot of our headspace, doesn't it? We think a lot about money. We, we have decisions we make every week. Uh, money has this amazing ability, whether we have a little or a lot, has this ability to take up a lot of our focus. And uh, it can bring worry. It can maybe bring happiness. It can bring um, challenges. It can affect relationships for good or for bad. The Bible actually gives lots of warnings about money. One of them is the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And I really believe this money thing is why God chose to establish putting him first in our money and our giving called the tithe in the Bible, which means one-tenth of our income. And so here at Worship Center, we give you opportunity to do that. It's what uh, gives us that privilege of, of giving and breaking that power of money in our lives. It's declaring that, hey, I'm putting the kingdom first. And it's also the way to say, hey, I really believe what this local church is doing, and I want to be a part of it. So as we give this morning, I just want to encourage you uh, to let God take your money and turn it into something great instead of having money bind us up. Let's see him set us free through our giving. You can give online. You can give uh, text to give. Or if you're here in the house, you can give in the boxes. They're located at every exit of the auditorium as well as along Main Street. Well, this being the first weekend of the month, we also give an opportunity to give toward our building. We're accelerating the pay down of our building. Uh, we've been in here about 10 years now. And our mortgage payment each month is currently about $18,000. You may recall last month in September, someone paid the mortgage. So everything else that came in uh, went toward that. So $62,000 came in last month. And yeah, it's something to thank God about. So we were able to pay down uh, an additional 
$45,000 because of uh, the extra that came in toward the principal. The balance is now down to $1.5 million. I'm just so grateful for what God can do through people uh, who, who obey those promptings of the Holy Spirit and God's faithfulness in paying this off. So I would encourage you, if you are texting to give, the keyword is building. Again, you can uh, put it in the boxes here or give online. So I'd like to just pray over our tithes and our building giving. In Jesus' name, Father, we come to you and are so grateful, Lord, that you've given us this privilege of of giving, Lord, of breaking the power that money can have over our lives, Lord, by giving to you first. And Lord, this morning we declare that your kingdom come and your will be done. And God, we put legs to that through our giving, Father. And we thank you for bringing order into our lives, into our finances, breaking the power that money can have over us. Thanking you, God, that we can in turn use money for your good and your kingdom. And Lord, as we give our tithes, as we give in toward the building, we're so grateful for your faithfulness in your name. Amen. God bless you as you give. Good morning, Worship Center. And so just to kind of keep you awake, because my voice can be so soothing, I'm going to ask if you can to stand to your feet. Those of you watching online in your living room, you can do the same thing in your pajamas. And we're going to read Galatians 5. You can follow along on the screen. And it says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, otherwise known as Facebook. Just kidding, it doesn't say that. Selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So this next part, if you could read it along with me, those of you watching at home, uh, standing on your feet, if you can read it as well aloud. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So Lord, we thank you for your word, which is truth for our lives, and we need truth today. There's so much out there, so many lies that we can believe about ourselves, about you, and so we grasp a hold of this truth in Galatians, and we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us. Holy Spirit, you have something for every single person in this room and online that you want to say to them. And so I pray that they would have an encounter and experience with you, the creator of the universe. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And so I believe that we were made to be joyful. 
We were made to be joyful. And that's on the screen, and you're like, Shannon, that's not proper English. And the proper English lady that works here on staff named Chelsea told me that's not proper English. And I said, but I wanna do it that way because if we're spirit-filled, if we're spirit-full, if we're full of the spirit, then we should be joyful. And joy is my default because I am filled with the Holy Spirit. Joy is my strength because of Jesus. And joy is life-changing when it's genuine. So I just gave you the whole message. So if you zone out, you have one of those Sunday morning church moments where you're like, you got the whole thing. But don't zone out. Pay attention, right? So we're made in the image of God. It says in the beginning of the time that we were in Genesis, that we were made in the image of God. Pastor Matt says all the time that you were made on purpose for a purpose. Look to the person on your left or your right and let them know you were made on purpose for a purpose. But unfortunately, because of what happened in the Garden of Eden, because of sin, we've been corrupted and we, there's something wrong. Like, it doesn't take much to notice that something's wrong in the world. Like, you can go out the front door and realize something's off. You get on social media and you're very aware that something's not right. Um, and the result, that's the result of sin. That's the result of sin. Jeremiah 17 says, the human heart is the most deceitful thing. It is the most deceitful of all things. There's something off, there's something wrong within us. And so because of sin, our factory settings have become flawed. The way we were originally intended and created and designed to be is not the way that we currently are because of sin. What comes naturally is our sinful nature, right? It's so easy. Like, it just comes naturally. And then that verse in Galatians talks about those things. Sexual morality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties. Those just all come naturally. And for some reason, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are crazy hard. They do not come natural, but they're the way that we were originally created and designed as human beings to be. It was our default setting, the way we were made. And it's kind of like if you have a computer. Anybody own a computer? If you own a computer, yeah, yeah. Those of you watching online, you might be watching, watching on it. If you own a computer and it doesn't have an apple on it, you probably have more problems than others. Sorry, can I say that? <laughs> I covered my apple up. And you probably, when you call the tech department or you call for help, they tell you something along the lines of, did you try turning it off and back on again? And you're like, yeah, I did that, it didn't work. And then they say, okay, we need you to do a backup and restore your computer to its factory settings. Which means you are, you are basically taking your computer and you are making it go all the way back from the moment it arrived in the mail and you first got it. Restoring it back to the way it was originally created to be before it got that virus and sent emails to everyone on the church staff and beyond, right? It's restoring it back to the proper way that it's supposed to be. And us as human beings are the same way. There's something off, we've got a virus. It's not just corona, it's sin. And sin has caused us to drift away from the way we were originally created to be, and now we need to be restored back to our original factory settings. And I want you to know there's hope. We can be restored back to the way that we were originally created to be. Joy is my default because I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Joy is my default because I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And so what is joy? I had to look it up because I don't know sometimes what words mean and they have multiple meanings. And so this word means it's the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. It's a state of happiness is to experience great pleasure or delight. So then I'm thinking, okay, what's the opposite of joy? So those of you watching online right now, you can go ahead and type in the comments uh, just what you feel like is the opposite of joy. Those of you in the room, if you could maybe one at a time, first service, they all did it at once. They couldn't understand anything they were saying. What is the opposite of joy? Anyone wanna yell out some things? Well, what, uh, louder. Despair. What was over here? Anger, sadness, anything else? Anxiety. What was back here? Disappointment. 
hopelessness, sorrow, sorrow, angry, frustration, hatred, man. So I looked up, I didn't look up yet, but I took all those words because I I was wondering what's the opposite of joy, and I wanted to sum it up all in one word that would encompass all of those things. And the word that I summed it up with, which I did get approval and a permission to say in a church setting, (laughs) now you're like really nervous, is jerk. And jerk means an annoyingly stupid or foolish person, an unlikable person, especially one who is cruel, rude, or small-minded. And so there's two positions that we can take in this life. There are two things that I believe that we can be known for. The first thing is that we can be known as a joy, right? Everyone wants to be in this chair. You want to be known as a joy to the people that you live with, work with, married with, sleep with. You want to be a joy. But unfortunately, because of those the virus, those, those things that are off within us because of sin, we have a tendency to default to jerk. Yeah. Look to the person on your right and left. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. And so how did we get here? It's sin. Why is someone a jerk and not a joy? It's because of sin. It's because of self-centeredness. We can be known to people as a joy or a jerk. What is your default? What are you known for? No one wants to be around a jerk, but yet we sit here and we're angry and we're bitter and we're spiteful and it just becomes our default. And you're like, well, Shannon, that's not right. Like, just because you're not joyful all the time doesn't make you a jerk. That's true, but you have a tendency to shift this way. Before you know it, you're sitting in the chair and no one wants to be around you. When I was a kid, I used to sing this song that went like, nobody likes me, everybody hates me. Yes, I'll eat slimy worms. You remember that song? Okay. That sounds, anyways. That wasn't in my notes. Um, we only look out for ourselves. But Galatians 5.22 says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Who produces it? Holy Spirit. And so when we surrender our lives to Christ and we, we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we're yielded to the Holy Spirit daily, God is restoring us back to our natural factory settings, which is to be joyful, to be a joy and not to be a jerk. So I'm processing through all this as I'm studying and I'm thinking, well, I've told people many a times when they're asked, are you a believer? Yeah, I'm a believer. I'm a spirit-filled Christian. Everyone ever say that? I'm a spirit-filled Christian. And basically what I'm saying when I say that is, uh, is that you should see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in my life. When I tell you I'm a spirit-filled believer, that's what I'm saying. And so if you don't see those things in my life, then you probably should ask me, am I really who I say I am? Ugh, that hurts, doesn't it? If we say we're spirit-filled believers, but no one can see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in our lives, then are we really who we say we are? Because the Holy Spirit is the one that produces this fruit in our lives. What fruit do you see? What is your default? And I know what you're thinking. You're like, well, Shannon, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And there's an election going on, and there's social injustice, and my kids are in school one week, and they're out of school the next week, and they want me to do homeschooling, and then they're on their devices all the time, and I have to wear a mask and get my temperature checked, and things are hard, and you want me to be joyful? But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in us, right? Not me, the Holy Spirit. I was made to be joyful. So there's this account in Acts where we see two men in a situation that I would personally probably be a jerk. And they make the decision to be a joy, to have joy, to be the way they were created to be. 
It's Acts chapter 16, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit of it because it's a long story, but it's talking about Paul and Silas, and they're traveling, and they're evangelizing, they're sharing the good news of the gospel and what Jesus did, and they're praying, they're going to the temple. And so every day they would go to the temple and pray, and this lady would follow along behind them, and she was filled with an evil spirit, and she would scream at the top of her lungs every single day as they walked to the temple, these men are servants of the Most High God, which is the truth, So, I'm, but I think it just it probably gets annoying, right? It's kind of like if you have children and you're a mother and you're walking along and all you hear behind you is mom, 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 mom. And Paul's just like, in the name of Jesus, leave her. He can't take it anymore. Maybe that's what you need to do the next time that happens at home. In the name of Jesus. And this just, this, it creates this panic and like this mob ensues. And so it picks up in verse 22 and it says, a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooded rods. They were severely beaten and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. And so the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening. Paul and Silas are beaten almost to death. They are taken to the inner dungeon, not the external dungeon where it's easier to escape, the inner dungeon, and they're locked in stocks. There's no way out. It probably looks hopeless. And in the middle of that, they choose to sing and worship their God. The word here in the Greek for him is huneo, and it means to celebrate God in song. And I don't know about you, but I don't know of anyone that's celebrated as a jerk. I don't know that they go together. They're celebrating that they're sitting in prison, and God is still on the throne, and he knows the end of the story, and it's going to be okay. Paul and Silas default to joy because they are filled with the Holy Spirit. On the other hand... I could probably see this situation looking like this if they defaulted to jerk. Probably Silas saying, Paul, this is all your fault. You just had to go off the handle and tell Jesus that, to set her free and now she's free and now we're here and this is all your fault. And what were you thinking? Now we're locked up and we're never gonna get out and what are we gonna do? We're gonna die and, and I'm beaten, and, and, right? But they default to joy. Did you know that Jesus made us a promise before he left this earth? He promised that he would never, ever, ever leave us alone. He promised that he would send the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit would not just be with us, but would be in us. And he's explaining to his disciples that he's got to go do this thing called the cross. He's going to be whipped and bruised and crucified, die on this cross, and then he's going to rise from the dead. And he's trying to explain to them that they're going to grieve, that it's going to be hard, but he's got to go do it because it's going to be worth it for the rest of humanity and that they're gonna celebrate and they're gonna be joyful and they just don't get it. And so in John 16, Jesus realized they wanted to ask about it. And so he said, are you asking yourselves what I meant? I said, in a little while, you won't see me, but a little while after that, you will see me again. I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn over what is gonna happen to me, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. It will be like a woman suffering the pains of labor. When her child is born, her anguish gives way to joy because she has brought a, a new baby into the world. I don't know what, exactly what that is talking about, but I'm just kidding. So you have a sorrow now, but I will see you again, and then you will rejoice, and no one can rob you of that joy. At that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I tell you the truth, you will ask the Father directly and he will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. Joy is my strength because of Jesus. Jesus knew what he was about to do was gonna be hard for those disciples and they were gonna grieve and it was gonna be, they were gonna cry and it was gonna be just depressing and it was gonna seem hopeless. But he knew that on the other side of this, it was gonna be joyous. It was gonna be worthwhile, not just for them, but for all of humanity. It's joyful because we have a joy because we get what we don't deserve. I'm a sinner, I deserve 
I deserve punishment. I don't deserve grace. I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve to have a relationship with the holy God and the creator of the universe. But because of Jesus, I can have a relationship with the person that created everything, God. And as Christians, it's gotta be crazy hard for people that aren't Christians and are like, wait, what? You're full of joy because of, of this man who was beaten and, and when you think about the cross, isn't that kind of depressing? It is, but it's hopeful because we know that Jesus went to that cross. He carried our sins, he carried our shame, he carried our pain, and he brought restoration. He, he reset us back to our factory settings, and then to top it off, three days later, he rose from the dead and conquered the grave. And so there's no fear of death. There's no fear of what's gonna happen after November 6th. There's no fear about what's gonna happen in 2021 because we know the end of the story. We know exactly what's gonna happen because Jesus did what he did and it's written in a book. And so we can have a firm faith and foundation and stand in the midst of a pandemic and have joy because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. I'm sure that's all of your favorite verses and you've memorized it, right? No. But that's because of Jesus that we can live that way. Because of Jesus, I pray that the source of hope would fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. And then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's Romans 15, 13. Because of Jesus, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, I have been restored to my original setting, the way I was originally created and made to be, and I can have joy no matter what is going on around me. I was made to be joyful. And when I am joyful, it impacts other people's lives. They see it, especially when it's genuine and when it's real. Joy is life-changing when it's genuine. My joy needs to be real. And too many of us, I'm there, we try to fake it. Someone asks how you're doing, and you're like, life's good, I'm great, everything's good, praise the Lord, amen, hallelujah. You know, we come to church on Sunday morning, we just fought with our kids and our wife and our dog and whoever knows what else the whole way here, and we drove through the city and wondered why they ripped up every single street all at the same time. <laughs> I live in the city. And, and someone cuts us off, and then all of a sudden, it's like we pull onto this magical campus and we're full of joy. And it's not genuine and the world doesn't want it. It's impossible to sit here in the seat of a jerk and try to pretend you have joy. It doesn't look good, it's awkward, it's weird. It's like, oh, I got joy, I got the joy. <laughs> and you're like, no, you don't. Your skinny jeans are just too tight. <laughs> That's how you get rips in them, no. Our joy needs to be genuine. We need to stop faking it. And it's not attractive. But when it's genuine, it's very attractive. Let me show you what I mean. Hold on one second. Bear with me. This is how you look when you show up at church and you pretend to be full of joy. <laughs> this is how you look when you go to work and you pretend that life is hunky-dory. <laughs> we come in, we sit in that jerk chair, and we sing, Jesus hated all, <laughs> and drool is running down our face, and we wonder why no one wants to be a Christian. <laughs> because you look ridiculous. The world is attracted to genuine joy, and genuine joy occurs because of Jesus, because of our hope in Jesus. Jesus or Paul and Silas didn't fake it. In that prison, sorry, I still have some drool. <laughs> Paul and Silas didn't fake it. In that prison, they made a decision to worship and to have joy. Acts 16.25, it says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Can you imagine being one of those other prisoners in there and being like, what is going on? Those guys were just beaten. They're in the inner, inner dungeon. They're locked in stocks. They should be dead. And they're in there singing to this God. 
Like, what is happening? And people notice, and life change happens. I, I actually experienced this at one point in my life. I was working at Annie Ann's. I was working there for about five years, I think, Roland Pretzels, managing two stores down in Delaware. And uh, every day, there was this lady that would come, and she would order an unsweetened iced tea with lemon. And she didn't really talk much. I knew she worked at the mall. And um, every day just kind of came, got we got it for her. Sometimes we'd have it ready when we saw her coming. And then she'd leave. There was, wasn't much that would happen. And this went on for probably a couple months. And one day, she gets her lemon or iced tea, and she starts walking away from the counter. She stops. She turns around. And she weighs me over. And so I'm like, okay. So I kind of walk over to the side of the counter so no one else will hear what's about to happen because I'm wondering. She got a floater in her iced tea. And she kind of goes like this, and I lean in, and she's all quiet. She goes, are you Christian? And I'm like, okay, what do I do here? I have a choice. I can say yes, or is this, this could be a trap. I don't know what's going to happen. So I, I say, yeah, I'm a Christian. And she's like, I knew it. I knew it. You always have a good attitude. You're always joyful. You just always seem happy. Like, I, 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 I stand and I watch, and there's just something different about you. And that's not a pat on the back for myself or anything. It's, I'm just trying to share a story about how when we are full of joy, people take notice. And see, the crazy thing is that during that time, she didn't know actually what was happening in my personal life. I was going through a divorce. It was the roughest season of my entire life. I was struggling with depression. I was struggling with suicidal thoughts. And here I have this woman who pulls me aside and says, I just... There's something different. You must be a Christian because it seems like you're filled with joy and you have a good attitude. And I'm like, how is this possible? She doesn't even know the thoughts and the things that are occurring inside. Many times we think joy is an option only for people who are not depressed. But joy can be present as we walk through the hard times in life. It can be there when things get tough. I had to make an effort during that time. I had to surround myself with friends and with family. I had to be in counseling. I had to make sure that I had people that were making sure that I was thinking straight because sometimes things weren't making sense upstairs. I had to be in prayer and I had to be in worship and I had to be in the word. I needed to be, I had to make an effort. But somehow during that time in my life, I was still able to have joy even though I was going through one of the hardest times ever. And that's the crazy upside down thing about the kingdom of God. You can be in depression and still have joy because of Jesus, because we know the end. I knew no matter what happened in that situation that it was all under control because God was in control. He was still on the throne. And so it relieved me from having to try to figure it all out. No matter what happens in our world, we know that God is still in control. So Acts 16, 26 goes on and it says after they start singing that there was this massive earthquake and the prison walls were shaken to its foundations and all the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prison, or prisoners had escaped so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul, but Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and he set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. This man's entire household, their lives were radically changed. This jailer went from wanting to kill himself because he thought all the prisoners escaped to bringing the good news of the gospel to his entire household. And this was all because of Jesus. Prison doors open when we are joyful. Not just in our own lives, but in the lives of those that are around us. 
prisons of depression, prisons of self-hatred, prisons of shame, prisons of addiction. When the joy of the Lord is our strength because of Jesus, people are set free. Lives are changed, our lives and those around us, because joy is life-changing when it's genuine. And I know we all have people in our lives that are jerks. You wanna, you wanna be an influence on their life? Be a joy, because your joy that comes from the Lord, that comes from what Jesus did, will shake their prison and help bring freedom to their life. You're allowed to be joyful. I think you should say that to the person that sits on your right or left. You are allowed to be joyful. And then the person on your other side, that's your second choice, you can say to them, you were made to be joyful. So what is your default this morning? Don't say that to the person next to you. What is your default? Which, which way do you have a tendency to go? What do you wanna be known for? Do you wanna be known as a joy or a jerk? And the transition from this chair to this chair is possible because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. We've been restored to our factory settings, the way we were created to be. Joy is my strength because of Jesus. And so you have an opportunity this morning, those of you in this room and that are watching online, to surrender all of the junk, all the stuff, and everything that you're carrying to Jesus. To seek forgiveness. There might be certain things in your life that you look back on and you regret that you're like, there's no way that I could come and talk to this God that you talk about. But it's possible because of Jesus. And so as we spend some time in worship reflecting on what Jesus did, you can have a conversation with God, whether it's out of your mouth or in your head, and ask for forgiveness for the things that you regret. And tell him that you believe that he's real. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe, you will be saved. That's when that restoration happens. And then we walk out, living it out on a daily basis, surrendering daily. So have a conversation with God. If you're doing this conversation for the first time, or maybe you're saying, I need to surrender again, you can text the word ALIVE to the number on the screen. Now, why do we have you do that? It's because we don't want you to be alone. We want you to know that there's a family here, a community here that wants to pray with you, that wants to just encourage you as you start this journey, maybe answer some questions you have. And so if that's you, I wanna encourage you to text that number on the screen so that we can celebrate with you, but we can also walk with you. Let's reflect on what Jesus did on that cross and when he rose from the grave. Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white. Come on, can we stand and sing that together? Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. My sin.
We're not done yet. I wanna take a moment to give you an opportunity to be filled with joy, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus, like I said, promised us the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't leave us alone, that he would be in us as believers. And so we believe in baptism in water. When you go under the water, you know every nook, crevice, and cranny of your body is covered with that water. With baptism in the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Spirit means that every nook, crevice, and cranny of your internal side, of your inside, of your heart is filled and yielded to the Holy Spirit. And so I wanna give you an opportunity to surrender and yield this morning, to ask for joy, to ask for the Holy Spirit to come. And I wanna ask you to do whatever you need to do to uh, physically show the Lord that you are in a stance of surrender, whether that's raising your hands, maybe standing to your feet at home, holding your hands out in front of you. And I just wanna pray for you. I wanna pray that you would be filled with the Holy Spirit. So God, we thank you that we are not alone. We thank you are, you are with us everywhere we go. And so we ask right now in the name of Jesus that you would fill us to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. You would fill every nook, crevice, and cranny with you. We pray that any fear and anxiety and anything that's in there that's taking up space that's not supposed to would go in Jesus' name and that the Holy Spirit would come. I pray for joy to come, for peace to come right now in Jesus' name. Peace that surpasses all understanding. Fill us, Lord. Because Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Yes, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble and leave when you fill us, Lord. Oh, come and fill. Thank you, Father. Fill, fill, fill with your joy, with your peace, with your love, with your understanding. Yes, Lord. We thank you, God, that you are with us. We ask that you would be with us as we go into this week, that we'd be tangibly aware of your presence as we go to work, as we go to school, that we'd be aware that you are there we pray that you would speak to us and you would lead and guide us. You pray that you would give us boldness and courage to share the good news of what you've done in our lives with others. And I pray that this church would be a church that's known for joy. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you. We are so glad that you're here. It's not a mistake. You're here for a purpose. And so as you go into this week, know that you were made on purpose for a purpose. If you have any questions about what it means to have a relationship with God or about the Holy Spirit or how to get connected here at Worship Center, you can do whatever the links online are saying to do. And if you're in the room, you can stop by connections on both sides of the building. If you need prayer for anything, there's gonna be a team up here that would love to pray with you. We are a church that believes in healing physical, emotional, and mental healing. So if you need prayer for anything, we would love to pray and stand in agreement with you. We love you. Have a great week. We'll see you again next week.